Well, thank you for coming today on such a, a wet Sunday, but we all need the rain, don't we? Uh, I've uh, been looking at my brown grass for several days now, so I hope this helps. Well, greetings to you this morning on this 4th of July weekend. It's a four-day weekend, and that's uh, very unusual, I guess, for several reasons. But I did speak to Aya earlier in the week, and I said, you know, this is what I'm going to be trying to preach on, and uh, I would appreciate you coming up with some patriotic music. And uh, would you just help me now uh, thank the choir and Aya for your... Thank you. Those are some of the songs we shouldn't ever get tired of hearing, right? Last week, we explored the subject of time. Time past, time in the future, and present time. We talked about the first half of this year. It has come and gone, and so we continue to live in the second half of 2024. As we consider opportunities, perhaps change, and hopefully grow in our faith and perhaps in new and fulfilling ways. So time last week, and I want to visit with you a little bit this morning about leadership. It has been said that life depends on leadership. Families, organizations, nations need leadership. And so who is a great leader? And what are his or her distinguishing marks? Today, I want to look at three leaders. Two of them were our former presidents of the United States. And it will be very obvious to you who will be number three at the end of my sermon. And so as we look at the presidential situation, not to talk politics today at all, but I just thought about the presidents that we've had in our country and the leadership that has been displayed by several people in that office. And it occurs to me that the office of the president represents the highest office of leadership in our nation. It is believed that the founding fathers expected Congress to be the leading branch of government because of their fear of executive tyranny. But it seems that from the early days of the beginning of the presidency, it became an influential office. And in the 21st century, the executive branch has become the dominant branch of government, or so it seems to many. <clears throat> In my readings and research this week, I discovered and was reminded that there were 56 signers of the de de <clears throat> excuse me, Declaration of Independence. Names like Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, but also names that we're probably not as familiar with. Names like Charles Carroll, Thomas Stone, Carter Braxton, John Morton, George Ross, and a Presbyterian minister by the name of John Witherspoon. Of the 56 signers, at least half had studied what was termed in that era divinity school not seminary, but they called it divinity school. All 56 identified themselves as Christians. It is difficult to rank presidents, I think, according to performance, but I believe, of course, Washington and Lincoln stand out as great presidents. Historians grade some presidents down as others go up in recognition and importance. And those who have lost some of their admiration are names like Wilson and Coolidge and Hoover. 
Just how important is the President of the United States? Maybe more than Calvin Coolidge said when he was out for a walk around the White House one evening and ran into a senator who spoke to him and greeted him and, and rather in a playful mood, he asked Mr. Coolidge, who is it that, re that lives in that big mansion over there? And Coolidge responded very uh, glum glumly and, and sad. And Mr. Coolidge said, nobody. They just come and go. <laughs> in the reading from Exodus, chapter 15, verse 13, we read these words. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. Love of God, love of a country, love of a people, love of their freedom, and freedom for all in that country. That was written during the time of Moses, after leading the people out of Egypt. But I also believe it can be said about someone like George Washington and how he was identified and recognized as the father of our country and a great leader. But there are two other examples I want to share with you today. One is that I've chosen is Harry Truman. And the second is Abraham Lincoln. Looking at the leadership of Truman, I found the following. On April 12, 1945, Mr. Truman was summoned to the White House by the press secretary for Franklin Roosevelt. He was asked to please come quickly. He thought he was going to be asked to attend a special meeting involving Congress. When he arrived, he was ushered into a specific holding area, a special room, and when he walked into the room, he realized that Mrs. Roosevelt was sitting there. She greeted the then Vice President Truman and put her arm around him and said, Harry, the President is dead. Stunned, Truman was silent for a moment and then asked, is there anything I can do for you? Shaking her head, Mrs. Roosevelt said, is there anything we can do for you, Harry? For you are the one in trouble now. Later that day, Truman met with reporters and said, boys, if you're ever gonna pray for me, pray for me now. I don't know if you fellows have ever had a load of hay fall on you, but when they told me what had happened, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all of the planets had fallen on me. One of the reporters then said, good luck, Mr. President. And President Truman said, I wish you hadn't called me that. Truman was a reluctant president and he had many critics, but throughout all of the criticism came two of his famous mottos. One was, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And number two that he had on his desk, the buck stops here. Most have heard about those two mottos, I'm sure, but there was another uh, motto that hung in the Oval Office during his time, which read, always do right. This will gratify some people and astonish the rest. The reason I chose Truman is because of the many decisions he had to make that I won't go into this morning. History has a way of changing, but some of the things that Mr. Truman had to meet in his time in office were of course very, very devastating to our to the world and to a, a lot of people. 
And so I will not go into those kinds of things today, but I want to name just a few that perhaps you're not familiar with. I wasn't until I read them this week. He sponsored the Marshall Plan, which was designed to rebuild Europe after World War II. He fought hard for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which became NATO. Many leaders in Europe all agree that it was NATO that brought peace to which had never been possible in the previous 1,000 years until the period of peace began in 1946. In his second term, there continued to be many events that included the rise of McCarthyism, the Korean War, and the controversial act of removing General Douglas MacArthur from his command of the United States. Forces for repeatedly criticizing Mr. Truman and his administration for avoiding a war in China. And so today, we are thinking about leadership on this 4th of July week, you might say, and weekend. It seems that historians agree that President Truman has gone down in history as a significant person because, in part, the way he simply brought faith and good common sense to the office of presidency. When he finished his second term, he and his wife, Bess, got in the car that they owned and drove to Independence, Missouri, where he lived for another 19 years. Can you imagine what that would be like trying to do that today? Well, in order to keep it even today, I've talked about a Democratic president now it's Republicans' time, okay? Abraham Lincoln was my second choice, not in order of importance, but because of how I have chosen to end my sermon today. Lincoln shows us several sides of a great leader. His humor was obvious on a daily basis. It was said that he was the first humorist to occupy the White House in fact, there were several books written about his humor and published not only in the United States, but uh, in Europe as well. It was said about his humor that he could make a cat laugh. Now, I've shared with you before about some comments with a cat, but I'm not going to, I've never seen a cat laugh, but at any rate. Lincoln once said in the darkest hours of the Civil War, I laugh because I must not cry. That is all. That is all. Even with all of his huge pressures and decisions that he had to make, he was able to have a sense of humor. He was at once asked of, of being a two-faced man. And he was accused of being a two-faced man. And his response was, to the man who said that, Dear sir, I leave it to my audience if I have another face. If I had another face, do you think I would wear this one? <laughs> there were two major themes that dominated his thought on a daily basis. His life, his decisions, his action. One was the restoration of the Union as the experiment of government of and by and for the people. And the second was the abolition of slavery. I learned he was a lover of Shakespeare and he read and reread the King James Bible. One of his most famous speeches, if not the most famous, was a speech that he gave on November 19th, 1864, as he stood in the battlefield of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. 
There was another speaker that day. He spoke for two hours. Mr. Lincoln, his speech consisted of 272 words and was delivered in just a few minutes. It is called, I'm sure you recognize it by now, the Gettysburg Address. And so this morning, I want to put my feelings on my shoulder this morning and tell you that, you know, we live in a wonderful country. We have some wonderful writings. We have some wonderful documents that have been preserved. And for those of you who have had the pr privilege to be in Washington, D.C. and go through some of those magnificent buildings and some of those archives, it's amazing that those documents have survived all of these years. But I invite you now to listen to the words that are nearly 160 years old and I believe is a perfect example of Mr. Lincoln's leadership. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who have given their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought, who have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people and by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I mentioned in the beginning I wanted to speak about three individuals, three leaders. It will be obvious to you who I have in mind next. We know the ultimate criteria of leadership is manifest in God's revelation to us of leadership in Jesus Christ. The Bible puts it very clearly. The first shall be last. The leader shall be first of the servant. Love one another as I have loved you. The Bible said that Christ, who had the prerogatives of, of the Godhead, laid them aside and took on the form of the suffering servant. And so at heart, leadership emerges out of love, but not any kind of love. Not the love that grasps and the love that is obsessed 
and the love that controls, but the love that is self-giving, sets aside personal gain, is not interested in popular opinion, but very interested in serving people, all people who are loved by God. Ultimately, a leader is a person who is chosen by God to be a self-sacrificing servant of the people that he or she is called to lead. So let us thank God for the leaders who have been raised up as we remember and thank God for those who have been faithful to that calling. Especially, we thank God for the servant leadership of our Lord Jesus Christ, who leads each of us day by day. Amen.